the divisiveness, the violence, um, the cruelty in this country, I think he would be, I think he would be appalled by it. I think he would be heartbroken uh, by it. You know, he um, he believed in people acting with dignity. He didn't understand cruelty. And I think a, a lot of who he is comes through in in my new book and who he was as a person, who he was as a man. You wrote in the op-ed that uh, you said, quote, I don't think he would address his party's front runner at all. I think he would focus on the people who cheer at that candidate's rallies. He would point out to them that dictatorships aren't created by one person. They're created by all the people who fa fall in line and say yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, dictatorships are not are not created by one person. Um, you know, I wrote in this book about being very young, like about nine years old, and my father showed me the George Stevens film about uh, American soldiers coming to rescue Holocaust survivors um, at Dachau. And um, he did it because I, they had a friend who had been in a camp and she had a tattoo on her arm and I asked about it. Mm. So he wanted to inform me of what that was about. And, you know, it was very difficult, obviously, to see that. And I was a child, but he had he had a reason for showing that to me. And he said, you know, we, we need you need to know about this because it must never happen again. And that was the first of many lessons that he told me, taught me about how fragile our democracy is and how easily democracies can fall. And they fall because people don't stand up to a single person. It's not that single person. If people didn't fall in line, that person would just be the loud person on a street corner shouting about things. Yeah, you said your dad, you created a few headlines a couple of days ago uh, in another interview when you said you were in favor of cognitive tests for, you know, did you mean that or well, what happened? Okay, you know, this was a very lengthy interview, the Meet My Meet the Press interview with Kristen Walker about my book. Mm. And that was one question. It was a very reasonable question. And I gave a very reasonable answer. And I was kind of amused, annoyed also, but kind of amused that um, a lot of media outlets extracted out of this whole interview, extracted that one thing. Uh, you know, what other answer could you give? Do you think that there should be cognitive tests? Well, sure, I guess so. I mean, one of my But there say aren't no? right now. The question is, there aren't right now. And we have an election between okay. two men that, you know, the vast majority of Americans say is too old, and one of whom many Americans, or both of whom many Americans, think may be not cognitively up to the job. Okay, it's well, let me, let me approach this from a bigger perspective then, because I think it's a little simplistic to talk simply about age and cognition. It's not that clear a connection. Um, early onset Alzheimer's happens before the age of 65. That's the, the line of demarcation that has been put down for that, um, 65. Frontotemporal dementia, which is what Bruce Willis has, typically, not for him, he got it in his 60s, typically frontotemporal dementia strikes people much, much younger in their 40s. So it's, it's like I said, it's a little simplistic to go, oh, this person's old, so... Let's test them. Let's test them and let's suspect. So their you're for cognition. cognitive tests for people who might show symptoms of. Uh, of uh, listen, we know what the numbers are. Right now, we have almost six million people in this country who suffer from Alzheimer's disease. In a few decades, right. that number will more than triple. This is something that affects millions and millions of Americans, uh, including potent our presidents. And people are concerned about what do we do as our, not just presidents, but look at our members of the Senate, you know. They're old. <laughs> They're very yeah, old. But my point is, of those six million people, I promise you, some of those people are under 65 or barely over 65. You know, I ran my support group, Beyond Alzheimer's, um, that I created. I ran it for six years. And there were a number of people in there who had spouses in their 50s who had been diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. So that's what I mean. It's not, it's not a simple 
formula. It's not a simple disease and you can't just make these, these, you know, sort of clear cut things like, oh, this person. So there are people in their nineties who are sharp as a tack. Yeah. So you can't just, you know, be. No, it's not a one size fits all, but it's something, it's, exactly. a, it's, it's an oncoming crisis for our country as our population ages and people live longer and longer. Um, there are mm -hmm. some doctors who say that everybody, one, half the population, 85 and older, will have some form of dementia or Alzheimer's. So it's something we're going to see a lot of, and families well, are. And you've written I, so beautifully about it, true. you know, in now yeah. two books about the, the burden it places on family members who, for yeah. a decade, may have to care yeah. for this family member. There's no cure for Alzheimer's. No, there is no cure, and I don't know that there. Are I don't know that there will be. I think where we will make strides and where we are making strides is in the prevention of it. And basically, you know, what's good for your heart is good for your brain. Yeah. So that's where we're making the most strides. Well, Patty, you've written two gorgeous books. The newest one is Dear Mom and Dad, a letter about family, memory, and the America we once knew. It's out now. Thank you for your work on behalf of the millions of American families who are dealing with this disease. It is a tough tough thing I know. Um, yeah. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks so much for watching. Go to joinnn.com to find News Nation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.